what I'd like to do is to start this evening by thanking John Peck for all the work he's put in to get everybody here today. Now the first thing I go, so I go through my notes I've got here is to tell you that we're here really to try and explain certain things uh, about the hidden mysteries. Therefore, all of this documentation is available to the society to reuse, print, and make any uh, event of their own. And we've taken advantage of this uh, by putting it on the official website. And I have got some favours you to take, a buy, uh, take away, which is a little engraved torch and a card that will give you the URL where you may download the notes. When I actually planned all this, I was going to print off the... Uh, the books. And here probably. Which I have subsequently lost. Anyway, and, and they were going to cost another eight hundred pounds. So I thought I would put the PDF on the URL and you can put it on any device. And I thought I'd get all nice and modern. And on the reverse end of it I've done a QR. Those who know what a QR is, your your electronic device will identify it and download the actual notes for you. Second thing, as I have to say, really is acknowledgements. It took me, let's say, less than a week, because I, I, unless, of course, forgetting the first five years that I've been planning this, but it took me about a week to write down all this. It took my partner six weeks to take out all the spelling mistakes <laughs> and the rest. And then I have a friend, uh, so that's uh, Gina Sharp, who, who's done all the work. The one good thing about it is, with immigrants, that she's German and she was taught English and therefore she's been able to put the punctuation and the spelling in the right place. And then I have to give you my uh, acknowledgements to my friend Graham Sinclair, because I actually thought you take these PDFs and you stick them in a machine and print them on a banner. Oh uh, no. The software you need to do that is somewhere in the region of 800 quid, and you have their cool vectors and they have to be stretched because this isn't an A4 page. And that took another six weeks. I have never known how hard it was to try something that was so easy to write down. So we have to understand that. Now, the second reason, I guess, is why I'm here, is that I am always disturbed how people always misunderstand everything. I mean, one of the things that you will know about is there was a thing recently in the, uh, in the news that the, um, the, the regular village pageant of the crucifixion was cancelled um, because they couldn't get a license and it was cancelled because the passion of Christ was recognised as a sex organ. Now I don't mind, this is in the news, you must have heard it, you're looking at me in blank pages, you didn't hear this, it's, it's all in the news. The thing that has got me is because nobody said with our multiculturalism that the guy understood Christianity but it is appalling that someone that knows nothing can stop a village tradition not knowing why it was stopped. And I think the problem is when people don't know, they make decisions that change everything. And masonry is bordering on that line. And so I thought if only we could tell people what they're doing and why they're doing it, they might be able to get a handle. And the latest thing I've got for that is in trying to get the craft to advertise our night here. I was talking in the provincial office at St. John, and the guy said, oh, my, I, I gave the simple example of the sonic carpet, which we have in there that you'll go and visit. He said, you should have been here four months ago when we were refurbishing the place. We had masses of argument of what to do with the carpet. But they did it with what they liked. They didn't do it because of the ritual. And I think that's appalling. It really is. We've got to get, understand the ritual so that we protect it. So this is what drives me. So... I've got the musings all around here, and I'm going to paraphrase it in here, and everything you can do is you download. So we say, the first secret of understanding life is perception. If you cannot see it, you can't measure it, you can't recognise the players or its parts. Anger limits perception. Only enthusiasm, the eyes of a child, will allow you to see without prejudice. Now, in the Sonic tradition, Light is the key word for education. And that's why I'm giving you all a torch. I am hoping you will understand the symbolism that I'm trying to light your pathway just a little bit further down the road. Now, our candidate for initiation, that is craft, is not blindfolded. He is hoodwinked. He cannot see clearly. The symbolism 
This symbolises the nature that an inadequate education and the promise of increased awareness for the candidate is willing to study the Masonic line and rule. Now, on entering the, on the uh, Masonic Lodge, the candidate is presented with a set of physical tools to moralise on. And one of these is the chisel, which represents the ability of the craftsman. We all know a good craftsman with a chisel makes wonderful woodwork. However, the morality of the lesson, as the chisel points out, the advantage of education, and it clearly says this, by which means alone we are rendered members of a regularly organised society. And each newly initiate is exalted amongst other tasks for daily advancement in Masonic knowledge. So we come to us. Our candidate in Rosicrucian is called a Zelata. So I have to look this up. And research of the name Zelata says cosmic initiation. Now to understand that, you have to have come another lovely word. You can't do this in tweets, can you really? It's called teleology. Lovely word, it's teleology. Now teleology was used by Plato in 347, by Aristotle in, um, can't read it, 384, Saint uh, Aislinn around 1000 AD, Immanuel Kent, I think we did him at school, Immanuel Kent, you should know him, 1750, in the Creek of Judgment. The whole point about teleology is it says is that there are a hierarchy of laws, and if there, is a, if, if there has to be a cause in order to have an effect, an effect is always created by a cause, and you can't do one without the other, and Plato used to go mad. So to understand that, you also have to understand that our human body has three kingdoms. The kingdom of the chemical kingdom, the animal kingdom, and the kingdom of the orbs. And each kingdom enforces its own rules of defense and passes its authority down to subservient kingdoms. And to see that, you just have to look at the Masonic carpet that you walk on every day of your life. So a quick example of that, the chemical body, of course, not in our control. You can, of course, mix the chemicals, but the result is science. Right? At one time, the body didn't move. The things blew and came in the wind and the rain and things like that. And somebody came up with this bright idea. We stick it inside an animal body, and then the animal body can carry it around to where it needs to go to pick up its chemicals. Thus, you eat or should eat for two basic reasons. To provide energy for the motivation and defense of your bodies, and you should eat selectively to maintain your immune system to prolong your life. We call these instincts. The five and two diet has at its core the concept that by not eating for one or two days, the digestive system will clean itself. But more importantly, it produces chemicals to enhance the brain cells, leaving that the failure to eat is a failure to ensnare food. You need to get smarter. And in fact, they discovered, even with Alzheimer's, if you go on that, it grows cells. So the animal body is controlled. The next one up, the animal body is controlled by a sense of touch, which we call pleasure or pain. And the ranking order of this, which is important, is enthusiasm. Anything you do with enthusiasm, the ability to work with unconditional love, doesn't do you serious harm. Everything else has a problem. Pain is the result of being unable to work with true love. Anger, failure to raise above the annoyances of personalities. Fear, caused by a failure to understand the reality. Grief, is when we are hard done by. Oh, thank you. I've got one over there, thank you. This is not fair. Apathy, I do not care. It is not my problem, I do not wish to know. And the bottom of the list, unconsciousness. I am not aware, I'm sleeping through my life. And the next thing to understand is, of course, but we have this um, row on television that said uh, the other day that they think they were a bit, that was off the news. They were talking about the fact that um, Islamic schools, and so they had this thing about what to do about religious schools. And it's quickly turned round to the Church of England, and it said Church of England's all wrong because we we believe in the creation of the world, and everybody but everybody that's got any sense at all who is prepared to speak would tell you that it's all evolutionary. Therefore, all faith schools should be banned. And this did actually remind me of my first thing that I did a long time ago, I think about four years ago, when I said, if it goes on, it is masonry is going to be dead in eight years, and we've got about four years to go now, because if you can't believe in God, and you're not allowed to do this, and you're not allowed to do that, where are we going to get our recruits from? So I thought we'd put a few th things down uh, in writing so that you can look at this. You can read it in date. You can read it later. 
However, so science today has explained so much. We are better equipped to understand the invisible. Musicians tell us that musical notes vibrate a wide range of frequencies. And with, and with the emergence of digital technology, we understand that the machines can generate a sound from a number. Okay, not really too difficult. Most, I did put this in for the elderly people here, at least young, young men like me. This is improvement on our forefathers. We had the piano. Do you remember we had the piano player? We used to put a roll of paper in it. No, you don't, you don't remember that. And you play the thing and the roll of paper would go around and as the holes went over the tracking bar, it played the note. It was the first sort of digital sound. Huh? So we've done that. Digital cameras, another one. This is fascinating. Digital cameras, they don't burn onto the emulsion like we had negatives. They don't do that anymore. They measure the altitude and amplitude of electronic frequencies and they register them in a form of colour. And in fact, your eyes do the same thing. It's a great surprise for you to realise that you do not see with your eyes. You don't do it. You see through your eyes. The energy goes through your eyes, something inside the retina, a few other things, turn it into signals and they send the signals to the brain. Now this is very easy proof, it's not technical stuff. Just buy yourself some upside down glasses. And with a week of running around with your upside down glasses, you haven't broken all your knuckles and your toes, the whole thing will come back upright and the brain will switch it. Right, so you don't see with the eyes, you pass the signals to the brain and the brain passes it up. Modern science has developed a system, you might like this one, to allow smell to be recorded into digital code. I saw a program about this and it suggested that television should have smoke-raising systems. Can you imagine it? Eh? Sexy scenes in the bedroom, dirty socks coming out, <laughs> fried bacon sandwiches all racing from your television. I mean, you know, it's unbelievable, really, isn't it? Anyway, I don't think that's going to catch on, right? But of course, the perfume companies are very interested, and that was what I saw. They did the, they, they generated the number of Chanel number no. five, and they started out with ammonia. Can you imagine sniffing ammonia? Right? And then they mixed all the numbers up until they got the number right and said, now this should smell like Chanel, and it did. I mean, amazing stuff, really. But I mean, that's what we know. But it's much deeper than that, it's much more important. Because in her book, Cure for All Cancers, Holger Reger, and I've put here the ISBN number so you can go and find it for yourself, she writes this rather crucial note that I liked. Every living cell announces its own present by transmitting on its own frequency. Fascinating stuff. We all know it, but not many people say it. And the last thing I want to show you here is a thing called scanner therapy. Now, scanner therapy was invented by the Russians. The problem is when you're in space, you can't nip down to the local chemist shop. So they invented this little thing. It runs on a 9-volt battery, and it radiates a frequency which is picked up by the skin, and it puts the body back into harmony and puts right the things that are going wrong. And this was, of course, 1980, and it got released in 1990, and I've seen the effects of some of them. So the bottom line is... Science agrees that your body rates and radiates waves of energy which can be identified by their frequency. And the body responds to energy as stimulation. Sound, sight, hearing, smell, touch and emotions are all wa energy, waves of energy and they are, can be classified by a number scoring system. Now that's the basis for where we come in. If science says this is what we are, we can now come to the ritual and start beginning to realise what it's talking about. But the first thing I bumped into was a very interesting article which I got through masonry, which is this book. It's called Man Made Perfect. And the first line, first chapter of the first, it's old-fashioned English, but it's lovely. And this was a lecture given by a messenger who turned up to a load of people, which I think we can call a trance. And this is what it said. To the science of number, or numbers, must necessarily form the basis of all religious thought. All attempts to render thought through intelligible being is entirely impossible apart from this consideration. Whether regarded as a series of digits added together to convey a series of geometrical shapes, used to convey a sense of principles, or as a series of geometrical figures used to convey a conception of form. It is immaterial. The great underlying idea, or scaffolding, I love that word, scaffolding, on which knowledge is built up, depends upon putting into motion, into vibratory wavelengths, our universal supple manner, which we call mind, a terminology, 
or a set of terms which gives us the abstract ideas, concrete language, which will give us reason, as it were, for our own existing world in material form. I wish I could write stuff like that. Really nice, isn't it? We as Rosicrucians, we make reference to the Hebrew mystic tradition. And this was written down probably 600 to 400 BC. That's what I'm interested in. So, but I would like you to imagine how they did this. Imagine all those men, learned men who made their reputations and free beer, teaching the verbal oral history, all having to write it down and agree with each other what they actually thought it all meant. You can understand, I think, why it took 200 years for these young men to die. <laughs> it must have been chaotic. So, this is how it works. First, there was a geometric character, or shape. This was then given a letter, and the letter was given a name. I mean, it was given a name. Right? Then there was a paragraph to explain the name. Then there were pages to explain the paragraph. Then there was an animal name, was assigned to provide a theme, and a personality. And then last but not least, it was given a numerical number all this effort to help us get a handle on what we're actually going to talk about. Masonry, I think, I just couldn't read what I little prompt I'm putting in, is of course the system of allegory, the system of allegory, no, what's it? System of morals veiled in allegory illustrated by symbols. It's all to do with numbers. So this is the language of numbers. This is what we're after. There's no good look down there, it's all in the thing. But and I, when the pictures come, I will put them up here for you. The Torah is interesting because it's reputed to have never been, at all, shall I say, has always been protected from change. Therefore, the way they wrote the first thing has never changed. Therefore, the letters they used have never changed. And I have put a quote in here because I managed to look up in, in the dictionary of where my references are. So you don't want to hear those, but they're in the, the catalogue. Number one, you'll recognise some of these. It, it represents God, the unity of the being, the generative principle of nature, typified by a central point within a circle. Remember, all this stuff was written 600 BC. <laughs> you hear this. Right? One represents everything. It's 100% of itself. The word A, alf, alpha, be it, A, has a definition that denotes that in the beginning there was only chaos. It's almost the first thing you learn in chapter. That is not to say there was nothing. It was just that whatever it was had no purpose, had no rules, and motivated in no purposeful direction. Next we are told that after contemplation, the chaos was turned into purpose. The agents that support our life. The agents, the ancients, called this water. It says so, the waters were there. To describe the structure and purpose and the proteins that would provide the environment for life to involve. Now, interestingly, when you watch the television, because so many people, as you say, have a little belief in everything, there's one thing that you could accept at everybody, is that's the DNA. And I think the general word is the DNA is the God script of life. But the thing about that is the DNA won't work without water. And if you ever saw that thing on television, it was interesting, because was Oxford and Cambridge were fighting on this, and they were writing all these sticks, weren't they, and trying to get the helix and get it all working. And the one that actually, when he first put it up, he forgot that it needs water. And in fact, it's fascinating that nothing that we know that can do anywhere cannot, it needs water. Nothing can start anything without water. Water is, is the principle and also is the decay. But nothing that you can think of can grow and evolve without water. So the idea that water came first in order that we may proceed from there is not a lie. But the dictionary goes further, and this is the way I got over this, because I hope you're going to like this, because I died when I read these, and I hope you are as well. Because the dictionary has a bit more attached to it. Because the, the, the Hebrews did a lot more. We have the Bible, all right? and then that's it. They didn't do this. They said, we'll write what we want, and then we'll write a cover note, and we'll write a cover note to the cover note. So Rabbi al Akavi, who's very ancient and well-known in Hebrew terms, I don't know if you've got any Hebrew people here, all right? but, but it explains that the mid, in the Midrash, and I'll tell you what the Midrash is in a minute, that there is a place where two pure marble stones meet. And this is where the higher and lower waters meet. 
This stuff was written in 600. And I say to you, is this not the incense of the double cube of chakra? Is it not the white stone of the marked degree, which is the keystone on the vault of the lower chamber? You've heard all these things. This is what they wrote. Now, in the Midrash, the Midrash is, is uh, a, a body of uh, what they call it, homolytic stories told by Jewish rabbis to explain passages in their books. And it goes on, Midrash is a method of interpreting biblical stories that go beyond the distillation of religious or legal or moral teachings. It fills in the gap left by the biblical narrative that only makes personal, uh, that only, that regarding the events and personality that are only hinted at. So, we've only done the first letter of the alphabet and we've already found an awful lot about craft. Then it gets better. You've hardly got your skin is standing up, your hairs are on your iron here. Number two is called the dyad. It denotes the active and passive qualities of male and female, light of dark, life and death, good or evil. Here we understand the second primary motion. The waters were divided, the far firmament was placed between them. The letter A incorporates the idea of conception. And the birth and birth, or the conception and birth are separate entities. Whereas A represents the creation of the world, it recognizes the teleology, that lovely word again, that this goal was the result of conception that had taken place earlier. One has been diluted, divided into two, each is now less than the whole, the power has been diluted and shared. The lower heavens are the nursery of our evolutionary path. The lower heavens provide the environment for learning, the university of life, that is, governed by those delegated to that purpose. Waters were the ingredients for life to exist. And the animal associated to this is the bull ox. Oh my God, isn't that one of the banners in chapter? And the acidity of, the acidity of administration representing the patience of those assigned to the task of our education. Where have you heard that before, eh? Three. This is another interesting one. Three is called the majestic number. It refers to the trinity. Uh, the triple essence of the deity and the emblem is the triangle. This is associated with the second letter of the alphabet. Alphabet, be it. Alf, be it. Gimel, Dalet. Okay? Be it. The mystic interpretation is having created the upper and lower heavens, God was desirous to live in or within the lower heavens. The power has been diluted and shared, and again, under the authority of the agent. The mystic interpretation is having created the upper and lower heavens, God was desirous to live in or within the lower heavens. The power has been diluted, shared, and again under the authority of an agent. The geometry tells us that one cannot be seen. For if you are included in it, you cannot see what's without it. Two points in a line cannot be seen without the third dimension of thickness. Three points could form an area, but can only be seen front and back. This represents the ability of God to be visible and invisible. However, the, mis the mystic three-sided geometric shape is actually a square. That's interesting. And it is drawn, because I think the reason they did this is when they did all these Hebrew characters, they were expecting to chip them into concrete. So they didn't do circles and signs. They, they kind of do things in horizontal and vertical lines and half lines and quarter lines. So, to describe the beard, and I've seen it in, in Mark Mason's Hall, by the way, in a beautiful chair that they've got up there. If you ever go to Mark Mason's Hall, look for that master's chair. It's got a beard in the back of it. God was desirous to live within the lower kingdom. But it is drawn, listen to this, by three strokes of the pen, delineating the east, the south, and the west only. It alludes to the vehicle of spirit that has been designed to hold your soul. The animal assigned to this concept is the lion. God, another one of those banners again, eh? Lion. The sign of the delegated power. Why did King of England have the lions all in this stuff? Our man with heraldry will probably tell us. The east, the lion, represents the fire, that God part of our being. The west represents the water, representing the material needed to sustain the journey through life. South represents the vacant driving seat waiting for your arrival. This is the house of God built with unseen hands. Four. This is where masonry comes from. You'll enjoy this. Not a lot. Number four indicates the operative influence of the four elements. 
we didn't have them here. The principle was that in our chapter, when, in our college, when you go in there, we have four elements and they wear different colored clothes and we talk about the elements in our work. But in the old days, they were referred to the four elements. And under this number, the, geomet the geometrical square, Pythagoras goes commuting in every name of God. Well, that's okay. But it's actually, this is the point. The square is actually a three-dimensional cube. Square, square, front and back. Okay? So thus we see that the cube, representing is the third dimension. It's the first thing you can draw when you put those four sides on it. It can make it look like a cube. And that's where masonry comes from. This presence to solve life on earth. The letter C, Gimel, has given the animal name of the camel. And the beast of burden that carries man on his journey. The mystic knowledge declares that life is about choice. And each soul is free to move as it requires. In mystic terms, the mason is a soul who works with the ashla, two squared, right, to improve his lot, his family, his friends, and his country. The way of the righteous man is called the camel. And that's part of the story of the camel going through the eye of the needle. It's all part of the religious stuff that was taught in those days. Thus, man is born with a teleology, lovely word again, indicating that goal is the evolution. The Royal Arch chapter de 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 depicts this as a man. Mason remarks the association of the master's place in the East for inspiring knowledge. The senior warden who provides every brother with his due according to his work places himself in the West. And the junior warden, the steward who challenges all who enter in, represents the individual soul and his place is in the South. No one's in the North. And that's where we come to number five. Number five is called the Elm of Safety. It denotes the octal number, the pentagon, the famous talisman. It represents the spirit now and the four elements. We're going up in the number system here. Some even call this the evil number. The letter D is Dalit. Dalit represents the doorway. It is the fourth north side of the square which is exposed. And its element is air. So suddenly we've done all the ancient things, earth, fire, water, and air. We've done east, south, west, which you say is Masonic. And there's a spiritual explanation for every one. Now the other thing to remember, which most people say, is this wretched word evil, which is always a stumbling block, because God is love, where does evil come from? So evil is the teacher's word for caution. For this is where the university staff, the agents of high spirit, water, force upon you the traumas of your life. The animal theme for this is the eagle. Surprise, surprise. The Royal Arch declares the swiftness and speed and celerity which the will of God and or his agents is always applied. The Masonic tradition declares that all your actions are known and have consequences. The Mark degree declares you go to the West to receive your due, good or ill. If you're a sword bearer, you will know that you always laid your sword down with the point pointing to the North. If you're a Mark Mason, you will know the sharp end of the chisel is always on the Bible pointing towards the North. Evil comes from the north. It is the teacher's way of saying, your words and actions create your karma, which what goes around comes around. You're in charge of your life's vehicle. Proceed with caution. The uneducated soul flounders in the darkness, Masonic term, of course, and the educated soul makes choices. Thus we have the four beasts of John the Divine, no less, bowing down before God, the ox, the lion, because they say man, I say camel, and the eagle. And the interpretation of that is teleology. Bowing down means giving reverence to the higher authority, because they are subservient to the higher party. And that's the very foundation of all life. Now, wake you up. This is interesting. This is your Dan Brown moment. Six, this is actually the Royal Arch Jewel, which you'll understand is not the, it though it does represent the six very closely. It, it's the view of dimensions of all things, four cardinal points, etc., etc. But the triangle base at the bottom, I'll put there, that's on the banner down there somewhere. I think I've got a thing that works. Right? This bit here. So the, the bottom bit here, blue bit, right? that represents the spiritual elements that lie within us. And the triangle base at the top 
shows the strength of our animal body being supported by the spiritual elements. That's that bit up there. And what we're interested in these little bits here. Because look at this here. Well, I have to apologize. I'm just going to apologize for this. But I went to someone the other day and they said anything with a G in it is American. I hadn't noticed that before. But I thought this picture looked nice and pretty because here we have the all seeing eye, here we have the kingdom of the orbs, and here we have the dividers, the compasses, which is representing these two bits here, which is, of course, the top part of the triangle of spiritualism. So it says here the compass enables the mason with accuracy and precision to ascertain and determine the limps and proportions of its several parts, thus reminding of his unerring justice determining for us the extent of good and evil. That is your spiritual controlling your life. And what have we got up here? Now we go, we go to the other one, which is the animal passions. And in fact, there is a lecture on this that we had, and they say almost the same thing word for word. There is a Masonic lecture in get older. They gave it in chapter the other day. It was really impressive. But it's, so the apex or V is the bloodline, the source of life on earth. And guess what I'm really saying to you for us men, that this is the part of woman's anatomy that we all worship. And that's what Dan Brown was talking about. It's the desire of animal passions and procreation. The Royal Archdew reflects two worlds within the entwined arrangement. And in fact, it's a two sign thing, and it is engraved on both sides, the hidden and the visible, and you're meant to put your name on one side and your chapter name on the other. So noti and notice that in here, what we did talk about it, is talking about the planet of the orbs, which is the kingdom of the orbs again. All influences come to bear. So it's six points, six sides, and six triangles. Six, six, six. We've done all the other animals. This is the mark of the beast. It is you. This is the battleground of your life where the animal passions and your educated higher self decide what's important in your life. Seven. Now, seven here gets intriguing, if, if these aren't intriguing enough. In fact, so I have better read this. Seven is termed the most venerable. It refers to the creation of the world. And this is the first thing I hear on television when people go, going, Chris, do you believe the world was created in six and a half days or whatever it was with one day for seven? It's all numeric numbers. They wanted a seven. So they made it seven because seven is the, is the number that creates creation. It is not conception. You don't get pregnant with seven, you give birth. So, understanding this number was the very key that opened everything that I'm telling you today. All right? It is the doorway that revealed the secrets. And I got this all out of chapter. I was studying the chapter ritual when I discovered all this. Having spent many hours bemoaning to my ignorance to my maker, I'm a pretty profound thing, God knows about me. I knock on his door damn nearly every day saying, what, tell me more, tell me more. And he sent a stranger amongst us. And the stranger turned up and gave us some homework. Of course, we were a bit shattered about this, and there are people in the audience who know exactly what I'm talking about. But the problem is, if you ask God to tell you how to do something, and someone turns up and asks you to do it, you have to do it. It's like being, a, being at university. You go and sign up with a professor, you have no idea what he's going to tell you, and if halfway through he gives you some homework, you're not going to understand why he's giving it to you until you go away and do it. And you either say, I'm not going to do it and walk out, or you think, well, I came here, I might as well do it. So we decided to do this. So what we did was we took a Masonic skirt, which I'm sure you all know what that is, a nice line on the middle, three and a half metres, <coughs> create a circle. Dead easy, really. Horror of horrors. We've now got to put 20 candles equal distance all around the outside. <gasps> my God, where's my calculator? And of course, it's all schoolboy mass. I hope you've worked it out in your head already, because it's just so tricky. You can't help but admire the master. Well, we know what schoolboy mass is, don't we? What's the circumference of a circle? It's pi times the diameter, is it not? Pi times the diameter. So what we've got to do is to find out what pi times the diameter is and divide it by 22. And do you know what pi is? Come on, you must be able to help me here. You must know what pi is at school, not the percentage. It's 22 over 7. So we have this wonderful thing, isn't it? 22 over 7 multiplied by 7 over 22 is 1. I mean, it's, it's trivia. It's just that when you think it, oh my God, what are we going to do here? But once you sit down and think it through, it's one typical thing that teachers would give you. You know, you think you're going to break your neck and it turns out to be trivia. And what this means, the Kabbalah tradition declares that the manifestation, the manipulation of alphabetical, these alphabetic characters creates material materialization. 
And the lesson highlights the concept that the Hebrew alphabet is only 22 letters. And that when all these powers associated with the 22 letters are used in harmony with seven, the powers of creation are evoked. The seven is the number or proportion of which material enters into our three-dimensional world. The royal arch, Richard declares that all those who knew how to talk, uh, how to, talk to God, that that was known on the circle, could access other powers. Now, I did a, um, uh, an exaltation or a rehearsal the other day, and I realised I was saying something that I probably said for years and didn't notice. Because it comes to the point where the candidate comes up and you say to him, as you wish to come forward, we wish to advance to the ancient shrine on which are deposited by three, five, and seven steps. It doesn't say go forward and read what's on there. It says that you won't read on there if you haven't done the three, five, and seven steps. Oh, sorry, seven steps. So you have to advance by seven steps. Pausing and answering. But I mean, it doesn't say that by getting there you're going to see. It says that you only see it if you take the seven sets with special reverence to three, five, and seven. There's a reason for this ritual. It didn't say you just walk up there and see it, which is, of course, what happens. It's not what the ritual said. So. I got so excited, I've forgotten where I was. <laughs> Of the eightfold, oh, that's seven. So, okay, so, so I think that's actually, we've got to the end of seven, really. Hmm? Yeah, no, it's, uh, the numbers have done is right. So this brings us to number eight. Now this is another little interesting tree. For number eight is the first is 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 the first cube, right? So it's the first cube, and points out that all men are born equal, or with equal opportunity at least, but equal. It's the mother most desired being the number of justice. Now that's another one of these magic words, justice is also because it's the number of conception. All right? But they are the same thing. The soul's karma can be described as justice. For, where the, for this is where the curriculum of your education is preparing your next venture. Some describe this as the equilibrium realm of the masters. Justice reveals that your karma is fitting and suitable and designed to help you correct your path for your further enlightenment. So justice and creation are the same thing. We get wound up with some of these words, doom and gloom, that come all over the place. The Eightfold Path was taught by Buddha. It is in the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. It is said to be the Masonic Craftsman Works Five is public life. The Mark Man Six, where he's introduced to spiritual awareness. The Worshipful Munda under seven, the teacher and supervisor. And eight is the Royal Arch. It is the autumn of your life when you contemplate God. Nine. Nine refers to the perfection of the spheres, the first square of an odd number. It is the number of limitation. I remember when I was doing astrology, I used to say, is it Satan? No, Jupiter. Jupiter was the one of limitations. And you thought, limitations, it's all again nasty again. But what it's saying is, life starts with a square and ends with a square. There is a relation between the number four. The number four, one takes on the mantle of mortality. Like all life, waters provide the material for growth and decay. Now, the way I put this down is sort of... Oh, how did I manage to do that? Right. Um, sort of thing that happened to my brother, unlike my brother. Uh, he, he went to university. And my mother was a bit worried at first until she found out that there was a hall of residence and there was a thing called a food hall. So she knew he wasn't going to sleep in the rain and he wasn't going to starve to death. Beyond that, she really didn't grasp what was going on. He goes up there, he's signed up for a teacher, he has no idea what he's going to do, no idea what he's going to be told. But the one thing he does know about, it's full of boys and girls. And the most important thing of all is there's no parental control. <laughs> now, of course, we see that now if you go to Ibiza, I think, on the television, what, what your children up to, and God knows what. But that's what life is. When you're born, the mantle of mortality cuts out previous control. You're here to learn, to know what you know, and put it together by what you think is right within you. When you die, you take that off and you go back. Get off your camel and go back. And that's what nine's talking about. Ten. Well, that's the interesting one. There's lovely words here like monarchy and unity. But, of course, it's a one, which is everything, and it's zero, which is nothing, the chaos in which you came out. To the education man, this exposes the way to the kingdom of the orbs. 
like ice, turns into water, which turns into steam. It's all the same thing. It's the alternative path beyond the need of physical karma, the foundations of the spiritual life itself. Now, 11 is called the evil number. Again, this would be careful. This is known the omen of death and defeat. However, as usual, evil is just one of these words that people like to think it makes you cringe a bit. It, it's the teacher's word for go with caution, there are consequences. Number 11 teaches us that education and choice make the difference. You're now entering the realms of angels and orbs. So the last number, then we get on some interesting stuff, 12. 12 is, of course, the 12 signs of the zodiac, expressing the cosmotity of nature. The square of 12 is 144, and this is the limit of a Rosicrucian circle, and reminds us that there are 72 angels of God, all of which names are in the Bible, and they represent the 72 rounds of the ladder of Jacob. All these things you obviously already know. The 72 angels are attributed to a quinary, which means they are shown, that is, you divide them by... Um, 360 into 360. They're shown on your certificate that we give you when you join, and it indicates the angels are established workers within the four elements that we've already discussed, and their purpose is to guide, support, and encourage you on your journey. To paraphrase this language into a bit of plain standing English, it says that every day of your life, one angel is offering you tutelage for your life, actually if it's for five days, you've divided it out. For every five days, there's a different angel, archangel, that is sitting there to encourage you to do a bit of something that he thinks you should be doing. Now, this is the interesting part because we like to bring the science in. Bruce Cassie, in his book, described his discovery that light and energy appear as wave formations that pulse across our universe. This is really Christian belief, isn't it? By reducing the measurements to nautical miles, not um, common market ki kilometers. If you reduce it to nautical miles and then back to 6,000 feet, you get, 12 in you get multiples of 12, which he discovered that these energy pulses feed our universe. In his book, Ruth Cassie then says, at this point, I was wished to see if B flat, that's a musical harmony note, you know what that is, had any relationship to what I was doing. So I did some checking. It turns out that if you convert the value of B flat, you'll get a harmonic of the speed of light which happens to be the harmonic value of 144. And I've got a few references in here for you to check. This is no such, there is no such thing as solid matter, only frequency of pulsating waves of energy. Now, I have to say, I've written it here, but it intrigues and fascinates me that pulsating waves of energy in multiples of 12 units with a harmonic value of 144 create our known invoice and create our reality. Masonic and religious teachings tell us that God the great architect maintains 140 shards of his personality to maintain our environment. In Christians, we know these as archangels. These enhance and carry out the will of God. These two heavens depicted in the upper lower heavens, each 72 archangels, are governors. Our ritual shows the names of the lower kingdom as recorded in the Bible. They sit around the ecliptic plane and radiate their energies through the planets to the earth. See, my, I've written a bit of outline of our certificates we give. Thus, our astrology is a central part of Christmas teaching. It's just they seem to forgot to tell you that. The banners of the Holy Royal Arch chapter were, in the original, the 12 signs of the zodiac, symbolizing God controls everything. Makes sense, doesn't it, when you think of this going on? So now I've gone on to more interesting stuff. I don't know whether you've ever thought about why you're Masons. This is lovely writing again. It's quirky but it's lovely. So this is the constitution of the Grand Lodge, I call it ACM Reason. For those of you who know how to check these things out, I have no idea. This is the constitution, it was written by Lawrence, and I've written down who wrote it, where it comes from. But here it is, this is what he wrote, really intriguing language. A Mason is obliged by his tenure to believe firmly in the true worship of the eternal God, as well as all those sacred records which the dignitaries and fathers of the church have compiled and published for the use of all good men. So that no one who rightly understands this art can possibly tread on the irreligious path of the unhappy libertine, or induced to follow those arrogant professors of atheism and deism. Neither should he be stained with the gross errors of blind superstition, 
and may have the liberty to have in embracing whatever faith he shall think proper, provided that at all times he pay due reverence to his Creator, and by the world deals with honour and honesty, ever making that golden precept the standard rule of his actions, which engages to do unto other men as he would that they would do unto him. And for the craft, instead of entering into idle and unnecessary disputes concerning the different opinions and persuasions of men, admit into the fraternity all that are good and true. Wonderful piece of prose, really, isn't it, really? But it raises the question, what the hell is Dyson? Never heard that one. So I had to look that one up. Now, Dyson says, it's a philosophy of religion on the standpoint of reason of observation of the natural world without the need for those organized religions books can determine that a supreme being created the universe. And I think that applies to just about everyone sitting here. Now, I don't know many people that go and read all these religious books. I mean, the days of Sunday school have been long gone for me. So I don't think we do that anymore. Further, the term in dries the square does not, um, that the term implies that supreme being does not intervene in human affairs or suspend the natural laws of the universe. Typically reject supernatural events, etc., etc. So let's skip all that. You've got the point. What I want to tell you then is I gave up these for my new candidate. When the poor candidate comes in and you were one of them, you just managed to escape this. The question says the, su the supreme being does not intervene in human affairs or suspend the natural laws of nature. Why should this be so? Seems a good question to ask somebody, don't you think? When he's becoming a mason, why, why should God not suspend it? What, what would come up with your answers? Then we go on to the quick one, of course, do you believe in God? And then we come to the tricky ones, if, you're, if you've gone past those two. So at what point does God pause his own plan in order to answer your personal prayers? If he's going to do the prayers, he's got to stop something else, hasn't he? And that, of course, comes to the dumbfounder. At what point does he call time and say, bugger you, I'm going back to my plan? They're interesting things, aren't they, when you think about it? But, of course, the chapter gives all the solutions. In the chapter, we are told that God created himself by himself. He is self-serving. As the ritual declares, he is what he was and was what he is from everlasting to everlasting. Now, the first two letters of the alphabet, as we go back to this writing, which is fascinating, is AB. And that turns out to be a word. In fact, we use it in our ritual. Once you know you look for it, you'll see it in the ritual book quite regularly. And it stands for Father of the Father of the Universe. However, the letter A, Alf, was the first word spoken. It was not the first word written down. And there are volumes of this if you want to follow this. I mean, it really is quite intriguing. But the bottom line is that the beard teaches that A is silent and reflects sacrifice. Thus, when God meditated on the A to create the existence of the water, that was not his goal. It was a teleology. B was the desire to exist within the lower heavens, i.e. each of us. He doesn't care about himself. This is sacrificed and subdued. His focus is on us, our personal developments, for true love is a service to others. There is no need to pause his plan. His plan was always about us. The plan is that all souls should be encouraged to expand their knowledge, thereby raise their frequency of their being, ascend and return from whence they came. Now, let's put this into a bit more practice. Now, I've had a lot of problems with this because it seems to defy logic to everybody. I'm sorry about that. What I'm trying to say here, and I've lost my little thing, I had a glass. Oh well, never mind, I lost it. The thing about this is I call this the fireman's friend, to start with, to get your knowledge going in the right direction. The fireman's friend says that if you have a fire, there are three principles involved. There's this, if you like, there's, there's the heat. And I put it up there as the green, it is fire. And the fire can only exist if it is burning material, the green one over there. And then, of course, it can't exist without oxygen. So we're saying here that here is an implement that helps intellectual debate. 
If you take away one of those sides, the fire will go out. It's just an economics of effort, which bit you apply your loyalty. But this applies to spirit. And our forefathers, therefore, decided, what did I put here? That for intellectual uh, debate, they assigned three principles. The divine spark of life, the material body, and the intellect. And then they gave these names and numbers. And so water was assigned the number two and the bullocks. And it is the material body. Fire, number three, it is the lion, and it is the representative of the delegation of power. <coughs> and salt, is the name of camel, was the uh, animal's character. And this, in my book, is why when you have an initiate coming in, you lift it up and say, this is the triangle that we're talking about. Interesting part about salt. Salt was an interesting choice for me. And the, the idea is why would they call the, uh, <coughs> the, the, spirit, the spirit of self salt? Interesting thing Kemi calls it. I don't think salt is a chemical. I can't quite remember. It's got something very odd about it. But the most odd thing about it is the colder it gets, the stronger it works. So the further it moves from the heat, the greater your ego will grow, the more you think you don't need any help. The more you are to the source, you, you realize how you're the small ant going around in a magnificent plane and you're nowhere near in control of what you think you are. So the, the idea they chose the word salt all those years ago does something to me. Now, this brings us down to the next bit. This is, of course, the square. What we're saying here, of course, this is interesting to people think this is upside, this is not upside down, but it appears to be. Because what we've got here is we've got the triangle up top here, and the triangle is the salt, and which is man, and this bit which is the uh, camel, and of course it has to lie up with earth, because it's on here. So you've got east here, you've got south here, west there, and this is the north. And I'm going to show you a drawing where the guy got it upside down. But in principle, when you sit round there, this is the Masonic Lodge. You've got this, the master here, the fire and the inspiration, uh, the Jacenia warden over here, Every man has his due when you close the lodge, making sure if you've done, you've heard it all before. This is it. And of course, this is the one that is not tiled. And I don't know anywhere where I've been in where it's tiled. In fact, if you go to Bristol, they have a lecture on the candles explaining why there isn't one over here. Because it's so far north, the gate could go. But this is why the initiate starts his life here, because this is where you enter in. This is the doorway. It is the unsealed. It is the air where the eagle flies. Now, there's a bit more for this, just to throw it through. In the craft, we're instructed with the names of Boaz and Jarkin. Now, Jarkin is derived from Jar, which is a word for God, and Chin, meaning to establish. Boaz is come from the settled letter of the alphabet, B, and Oaz, meaning strength. Thus we have Jehovah, will in within the lower heavens create life by his power, and thereby establish our existence. The two pillars reflect the hidden concept of dark karma and dharma. And yeah, it took a while to look up some of those. Karma, as you know, is the circumstances of life that falls upon you, the traumas that you have to go through. And the dharma is the way your soul turns as a result. And the nearest explanation I give you there is a very old-fashioned Greek thing that said, man is head of the house and his wife should support him in all things. But the wife is the neck. And the job of the wife is to make sure the head is looking in the right direction. <laughs> okay. So now we've got the fact that the, uh, the Trinity tells us that God created his, by his power and strength, attached to us the shadow of karma, and encouraged us to learn from our mistakes. And once he established that, our lives were stable. The pillars are your own bodies, and they are hollow. And they store all the archived material of your past actions. And you will recognize this as mental stress. As a student, you'll have noticed that our Christian churches model their lecterns on the word of God as eagles. The north side is incoming. Evil comes from the north. Your karma is God's ordained will that blows in via the open north doorway. Now that's the end of the numbers. I've just got a couple of quickies because I thought you might like this of what other people have done. 
This is one of my favourites. This is a Christian uh, symbol. It used to be over the, uh, the archways or lintels of the early Christian people who were interested about it. And the thing that is intriguing is that that's S-A-T-O-R. That's S-A-T-O-R. It's S-A-T-O-R. It's S-A-T-O-R. So you can read it across. You can read it down. You can read it backwards. And you can read it upwards. It's intriguing. So it's like without end and without beginning. All right? So I had a look at this as well, of course. I thought we can't let this go. Of course, the words are satyr. That's a Latin word. I think there are people in here that know Latin better than I do. I think the apro is the one that's not Latin. It's a sort of a hybrid. But tenet, opera, and rotas are. So, satyr says, sower, planter, foundation of a, maybe we could use the word creator. Apro is the bad word, but it's got lovely English expressions in here because it says things like, it is the second declension. I can't remember when anyone said that to me since I left school. I can't remember doing these declensions. I remember having them sometime. It's the second declension because it ends with, the, with a sort of O on it, which probably could mean by means of, is the electrons that I like. Tenant, well, we know what tenants are if you hold buildings. They're people, they're holders, they comprehend processes, masters, or preserves. Opera, that's another word that, of course, we know about. We have operas, it's work, service, effort, purpose. And rotus, well, the rotus is good enough, it's wheels, going round wheels, going round. So some people say this means what comes around goes around. I'll give you another translation. The divine plan moves ever slowly, holding us to account by the wheels of fortune, karma. And our experiences of life are materialised through the azos of life, which the ancients call water. And this last one is just to show that I'm not alone in what I'm telling you. This is written here, 1902. This is his little private recordings of what he did. The interesting thing is, it's almost what I would call right. I mean, a bit, bit unctuous here. But of course, the thing to remember is this is the East, which of course blows his theory of what he's doing. So the master, the lion, sits on the East. This should be the West. Well, he's got the water. But he's got man there, and that I think I would call it. And then the thing is, this is the north. The eagle flies in the north. And of course, if that's east, that's got to be at the bottom of the page. So he actually got it all there. In fact, the only thing that I would disagree is he's got the man and the bullocks in the wrong place. And of course, the thing is, he should be rotated, because north is obviously at the bottom of the page, and the south is at the top of the page. But he wrote this in 1902. And I, I just can't tell you how it warmed my heart, after all this effort, to suddenly find a picture of exactly what I'm trying to tell you. So early Masons actually knew this. Now, I've come to the end of that, and you're sitting comfortably. I don't know whether you're bored, so I would like... To, you're, uh, I have prepared for you a little show. Are you bored? Do you want to eat? I can't hear what you quote to me. I don't want to offend anybody. Say again? Right, okay. All right, well, that's okay. All right, well, I'd rather that you had the food and you enjoyed your day. I have got a Masonic nativity play here that I have prepared for you. And maybe if some of you stay a bit later, I'll see if I can demonstrate it to you if you're interested. Maybe we take a break. You've been sitting very quietly so long. I hope you enjoyed it. Now, the whole point, which I didn't tell you, of course I should have done, that the whole point of being a Rosicrucian is we debate. People like me come up with ideas and we're meant to have lectures. The idea is that you read, you learn, and then you come and present a paper and we talk about it. And the more we talk about it, the more you'll get together whether you're right or wrong. And so we all evolve together. We are thinking man's masonry. So if you like what I said and you think it would be a good idea, we would like to have you, if you're a mason, we'd like to have you as a member. And we'd like you to throw your hand in with everyone else and challenge us with what you have discovered in your life. All right? If it
This is my Masonic nativity play. Now, the other reason, which I didn't have time to tell you, and I forgot, I guess, is one of the reasons that I am so involved with the idea of spiritual life is that our founder, Christian Rosegritz, was a German prince. He travelled all around the place, and he came up with these conclusions of what he thought would make an awareness for all us all. And he then decided that they'd have to keep secret for about 100 years so that everyone would get an idea of what it was, and then they went public. All right? And then when they went public, people didn't understand it. And there was a problem, so my intention is trying to make you really, really, really understand. Now, while I was doing all this, I came on with a similar experience. There is a man, 15 years ago now, so we're not hundreds of years, and things like that, and he travelled all the way around the world and decided to learn everything there was about all these different indigenous populations. And he did something which I think is more modern. Every time he found something that interested him, he took a degree in it. He didn't just say, I've learnt it, he passed a degree. He ends up with 28 degrees and a knighthood. And he did lots of interesting things to try, and he ended his life, when in fact there's a very odd thing that happened in his life, but the last part of it was just before the end, he then travelled through Europe and, and, and the Far East, and he went to all the hospitals there and said, bring me people with broken bones and I'll show you how to fix them. And then he ended up by saying, let's go to Australia and we'll build a hospital that doesn't take medicine. And that's what he did. So he goes to Australia. The problem was that uh, he was a New Zealander and his visa ran out. So he does what everyone does over there. They nip in the plane, cross the channel, whatever they call it over there, to New Zealand, got a visa and came back. He was barred from entering Australia. Man, 28 degrees, knighthood. He started life as a missile, whatever it was, thought you know, that was nonsense. It's got to be more in life than killing everybody. So he was an absolute pacifist, but he was denied. And a week later, he died in the most bizarre circumstances you can imagine. And the reason why I was filming this tonight is because he filmed his. And I have 15 videos of three, hour each, of three hours each of all the things he was trying to teach everybody. So long after he's gone, we have the evidence. And one of the things that I want to tell you, because I know about it absolutely personally, is that he held a meeting, a bit better than this, of course, because we were doing extraordinary stuff, healing and learning and um, eating food, the right sort of food, whatever they call it. And anyway, one morning they were out in Australia, probably must have been in the South West, because it was trees and, and cops, and, he's, and the young man, which is called Douglas Morrison, who wrote this book, they're walking through there, and they're oh, no, excited about what they're learning, and everything's up hype. And as they're walking around without thinking, his host, another young man who invited everybody, putting in his basket all these mushrooms that they carried. And they carried all the mushrooms back, except for the fact, of course, that Douglas, who wasn't paying attention, was equally excited, was simply swallowing all the mushrooms. And when they got back to the kitchen to clean them up, they suddenly discovered that every single one of them was absolutely poisonous. And he'd eaten these. And of course, with the brilliance of youth, he said, well, that won't matter. And he did nothing about it. Come 11 to 12 o'clock, and I hope there are any doctors in here, the tongue was black, the mouth was dark purple, and he looked like death warmed up. And of course, along comes Health and Safety, which is this poor nurse that's done her Red Cross second degree. And she realised the nearest hospital is over a thousand miles away, minimum, and the flying doctor is not going to get there in the next 20 minutes. This guy is about to drop down dead. But our man, who's been around the place, has a story to tell. He said one of the things he did was study under a shaman. And the final exam for a, sh a real shaman is you have to eat poison. And he tells the story that when he went for an exam, the poison was on the table, and there were three of them. The first one drank the poison and dropped down dead, and they gave him the same bowl. It does concentrate the mind. All right? And of course, he survived. So now, that didn't say that the, the John Whitman Ray, who I'm talking about, so John Whitman Ray, didn't say he'd taken the poison. He said he understood it from the thing. So he then tells Douglas Morrison how not to die because you've eaten poison. And he doesn't die. And that's the power 
of the thing that I'm trying to tell you. They say, are there any benefits? I've got, they're going to tell you all the benefits of it. So I'm going to try to teach you in this little play the benefits. And the interesting part was the guy came to England and we had a week in his house. And I can tell you I bent every part of his body for him to try and explain to me the, how he could be told within 20 minutes how not to die. Now the masonry tells you that all your words and actions and your karma is recorded and that where you are today is a result of yesterday. All right? So what you do today is going to do tomorrow, but that's too vague. What they don't tell you, it's five years. So when you were born, you choose your parents. The first five years is set in concrete, if you like, because it's agreed for the born. The time the child is five, you know what they're going to be doing until they're ten. Ten is eleven plus. Fifteen is either going to high school or whatever. Twenty is either in college or getting married. Twenty-one is have you screwed, twenty-five, you know, if you screwed up and got divorced. Everything you do is set, all right? But it's set in five-year chunks. It used to be seven years because seven is the creation. But if you, all these modern people tell you about everything accelerated, it just means that whatever happens today, is so. and I actually tell bereaved people this. I don't know whether they think it's nice, but I say to them, you've got to understand, three years are going to be living hell, and it's not going to change. But what you can say to yourself is it's three years. And I went through a pretty terrible patch, and I used to have the shakes with absolute panic attacks. And I hold myself together and say, you're only in the first quarter. Then my next one was, I'm halfway through. I never had another one because I got rid of the people that didn't really like me anymore. You know how it is. You, you start doing what you want to do because you've got no one else to worry about, and suddenly you're picking up speed on the other end of the thing. But it's always five years. And that's what people do not understand who think evolution is everything, because you can change everything. Now, what I've tried to do now is to present you with a Masonic nativity play in order that you will understand what I have told you previously. Would you like to stand up and hold this? I'd like you to hold that pointing upwards. Now, you might be pleased to know that I couldn't hold this, so we took out the bits in the middle because it was too damn heavy for me to carry. Now, I hope if I look at this and I say to you, what is that? And if you're a senior warden, you'll say, how will you be tested? By a square. And what is a square? An angle of 90 degrees or a fourth part of a circle. Okay? So, the first word of the alphabet is water. This man wears the blue cloak. This is the water. This is the universe of life, the beginning of how we can live on the earth. This is the upper kingdom. This is the water. Without water, we simply cannot live. Okay? Then we get the second letter of the alphabet, the beard. We know that, don't we, what the banner is? It's the lion. Sit. Can't see it. Can you, can you put it higher? Is it comfortable? Can you do that? I, I mean, this was built for those with bad eyes. You do understand this, don't you? All right? Now, oh, I put my book away. The next major thing in masonry is the first law. Yes, okay. You're worried about your books. No, no, no. I'm giving you space. Ah, right, right. Okay, good, yes. Now the next thing then is, that the next thing you've got to know is that the first law of all religion was you have to honour your father or your mother. Because they did what they thought was best with the tools they had. That doesn't mean they got it right. It just means they thought they were doing right. So whenever you look into this stuff and you find something contrary to what you want to know, that's not their fault. There's no, you know, grief and anger stops the childhood vision. You have to go with the flow and saying, this is what I've got. My parents had a different life to me. They lived on the rules that they thought. So the thing we know, what happened here, unfortunately for us, is that when the Pope and all these people went over to the Mayans and out of this, they realized that they were bowing down towards the sun. And they said, we can't have this, so they burnt all the books. But fortunately for us, the Mayans had found something pretty extraordinary. And I have no idea how they know this, but I know how I know, because Patrick, Patrick Moore, Red Sky at Night, Red Sky, night, Black Sky, Patrick Moore, this, he wrote this for his degree paper, and I've actually had it in my hand. And what the Mayans knew was that Mercury is so close to the sun that it interferes with the spinning of the sun, effectively. And that because it's all liquid anyway, the top of the bottom of the sun it goes round in 28 Earth days. 
So when we talk about women's menstrual cycles, it's the sun, forget the moon, that's a piece of cheese. The sun is the thing that kicks this stuff out. But the middle bit is held by mercury and it gets sputters and spits and something, it makes all these solar flares. And interestingly enough, it has a cycle. And guess what? It's 144,000 days. Yeah, interesting, isn't it? And not only is it 504,000 days, they realise that had another cycle of 13 times, which is like the apostles all over again. All right? And what they then realised was, in order that we know this, by the way, what they did was they thought it was so important that they didn't put it on Twitter. They went down and put it in a bit of rock. And they said, we want this rock to be prepared, protected, so we built a pyramid on it. And they looked back at that and said, oh, that's not going to last a thousand years. So they put another pyramid on the top with a small door. Relax or go home. I've got a heckler. Do you notice that? It's one of the family. <laughs> and then they put a third pyramid on the top. And you can't get this thing out because it's 15 stone and the door isn't that big. And they said they lived through four of these epochs. Because we've just done the end one now, whenever it was, so that's five. At 5,700 years, this stuff, knowledge that we're talking about, goes back. So, without the sun, nothing grows. So I did my research on the internet, and I found, for example, where's the first one? 1809, it was the coldest decade because of a volcano going off in the 500 years. Without the sun, everything begins to get cold. 1815. Um, this actually called the winter, the, it was the year without a summer, 1816. Thousands of people died. And my favourite, because it's what I've been looking for, this is what made me look for this, because I knew about it, but as usual I exaggerate and can never go back when I, look, I don't take the notes at the time. 1883, you're all old enough to remember that, I'm sure my granny was alive then. All right, it was heard 3,000 miles away. Krakatoa. Krakatoa. Five years without sunshine. A third of Europe died of starvation. The grass didn't grow. Nothing grew. Everybody died. So, without the sun, God desires to live in or within the lower heavens. Also, oh, by the way, the, the Mayans also wrote that in the beginning of their calendar, the, birth, the fertility rate drops. So the sun controls the menstrual cycle and the fertility rate. And they actually made a recording that no one's talking about, that during the first early part of their year, bearing their year is 5,700 years long, that the, the birth rate fell to 10%. So I'm looking for signs of that. But what we're saying is, without water, you can't live in this world. Without the sun, to spark the water, nothing lives. So we have a conditions for life, but not man, yet. This brings me to this little beast. I had a lot of fun getting this on the internet. By the way, I'm in bombarded with internet. Do I want toys? Right? Now, if, if the eagle, which you all know about, was to fly from the equator, this is what's 21st of March, up to the North Pole, how many miles would it travel? Oh, <laughs> no, no, it's 60 miles per degree. It's a Masonic thing. It's 90 degrees. Six nines are 54. It's 5,400 miles. So where's 3,000 miles? The sign of that equator, the sound of the explosion was 3,000 miles away, which is here, which is Wokingham. Wokingham is 3,000 miles north of the equator. That is, it would be if it was... Now you can turn it up so he's upstairs. Like that. All right? Now, the people of Wokingham now realise that they're blessed. This is another Masonic principle. It's called the Mushroom Principle. Right? The Mushroom Principle is you all live down here in the dark, someone takes the lid off, and the bird poops on you. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the mushroom principle? And that fertilizer is meant to encourage you to grow. Okay? So this, now we've got the first points. We've got the water. We've got the lion. I've skipped over man for the point. And this is the will of God making a life on earth possible. Now we come to a man in black. No, he can't put it down. Would you like to pick that one up and stand this side? Are you all right? Yes. You look like a muscly man. That's why I chose I you. You've, I fed you, so you should be all right. You certainly have. Now, right. Uh, no, upright that way. This one's easy. Right. Now, this is our man in black. All aliens have to have a man in black. Right. And the third thing, we've done the alpha, be it, 
damn it, I've missed out the camel. So here is, better bring it down, I can't reach that high. Here is our camel. <laughs> All right, if you keep quiet. This is the camel. <laughs> right? Now, the question you have to ask is chicken and egg. What do we know about that? Well, there was a bit of a trick here, it's got two humps. God, you have no idea how much trouble I had finding a two hump camel. This is female. All right, this is a female. And this is the soul. So, man on earth needs a soul, but he needs an image. All right? And this is where it comes to the most extraordinary thing that I hope you're not going to scream and run out. One of the things I told you when I was working on doing the thing is from time to time we get messengers coming to tell us to do things. And one of the things that used to happen is they would say, go to a special sacred site in the middle of Wales at 3 o'clock in the morning, usually the pouring rain. And we'd all get in our cars and drive off there. Because they said, when you get there, something bizarre will happen and it will interest you. So we do. And what's the point of having a teacher or a training if when they say you do it, you don't do it? You have no idea what to expect. And those of you that are talking about going to York, we went to York and it's the Red Tower that gave us more interesting things than the big tower on the top. It was around the corner of the Red Tower, if you look where that you go. Anyway, we then got this message that said, maybe we should go to the south of France. And owing to the fact it was midwinter, and that Gina has Rayner's disease, and the one thing about France I don't like is they all drive on the wrong side of the road, and then we've got to go through the ice and snow to a place that we don't know where we're going, it didn't sound much fun, so we decided not to go. This, unfortunately, shall we say, disturbed the group because they were so keen and we'd worked so close together, we did everything together, when one party, it's a bit like being in the forces, if half the party doesn't go, it leaves a hole. Let's say like that. So we were at home, Gina was sitting in her office, which is the kitchen, and she does the kitchen when she likes to cook, she doesn't like to be involved with anything, and then occasionally she sits down and writes her diary. And while she was sitting there, what happened was that we had a materialization. The thing was bright, with dark green, it was an enormous size, and it filled the whole room, and it had a jaw like a hippopotamus, and it had bulging eyes. And Gina, in a stroke of what I call psychology, instantly called him Mr. Froggy. And I think it's a bit like um, Robin Hood and Little John. I mean, he was nothing little and he wasn't a frog. But in her mind, Mr. Froggy. Now, we were excited about this. We did say something interesting. He said, amongst other things, the problem began where those people who were authorised to create man could not decide in whose image to create him. Now, of course, you read the holy books, they tell you that it was the Melchizedek's who were given the job to run the world. That's what the holy book said. I have no idea whether this was or wasn't. But anyway, the point was, we then rang the friends in France and said, guess what? We've had a frog. Have you got it? Yeah. And they said, guess what? This frog has just matured. They, of course, we're not rich, so they're sharing a room. Wife, husband, aunt, son are all in one room. And they're sitting in one room talking about the excitement of why they've gone there for yet something bizarre. And this is the real thing that actually materialised in the middle of this hotel. Oh, it's not a hotel. I don't know what it was. In, in, this, in what you call it in France. The problem is that it also dematerialised on regular intervals. So I don't want you to touch it because you might think it's fun that it disappears the moment you touch it. The people love it and they don't want it to go. And in the last few years, months, feathers? Yep. Months? Years? Yep. Two years ago, it started growing feathers. Yeah. <laughs> now, I don't know. We don't want you to touch it. But there it is. And so I decided, for a bit of fun, we would sit, Mr. Froggy. You better not lick the camel's ass. Mr. Froggy. <laughs> on there. Right. Now I want you to walk a little bit behind him. Now, I, you stay still. That's it. Now, I want you to... This is now a Masonic principle, right? What are two squares? Two squared is four. four. Four is the number of man's journey on earth. Two squares. Here we now have, we line them up. That's it. We have man on earth in the universe created by God under the duration of the will of God with the soul and the issues of man. And that's what we do in our ritual all the time. 
I just wanted to put it in the process so that you would get a grip on how it could look when you realize there are two squares, two squares are four, it represents man on earth within the horizons or the environment created by God. Thank you. That was my little wake up call. Maybe I should auction these off, but I think they're taken. <laughs> Now, I think the next thing is for us to ask questions if you want, and we'll try and fulfill what's in the um, college if you wish to ask questions. Or, of course, I know this man has got more intriguing documentations. You've, you've had enough, he's dying. <laughs> uh, well, I've said my bits. Make sure then that you take all the bits home. The lectures, not that. The lectures are on the URLs, on the website. My lectures up there, because I've got several lectures. That have made. The problem is, my secretary is revolting. <laughs> Someone has got to take out the spelling mistakes. Someone's got to put it right. It doesn't matter if I read them because nobody knows. If you're going to put them up for the world to see, one tends to like to sort of polish them off a little bit and make them a bit better than they were. The, the world is created by vibrations that appear to come across the universe. But the mind, some people call it, when you try people to get better and then they say placebo. The thing about placebo, is this, instead of saying a placebo is a failure, placebo is your state of mind. <coughs> right? And the, well, the problem is what we do, which we're, you're referring to this, which is, is a thing called body electronics. And the idea is that all your stresses and everything that you do in your life is locked in your body. Most people think when you die, the, uh, your life flies before you. Well, that's semi-true, but you don't have to die. And that's the wonderful thing about it. You don't have to die. You can put yourself in a state, if you like, where you take your foot off the brake, Take the foot off the accelerator, and all these emotions that you've ever denied yourself will come out. And if you can lovingly and willingly allow it to come, recognize it for it was. And the nearest thing that I can describe it to you that I think, because I'm a man, not a woman, was a story I heard of a woman in labor who delivered of herself for the baby, and someone said, how did it go? And she said, well, it was all right, really. He said, but that bloody woman next door, she screamed her bloody head off. Well, actually, she was out of her body, and it was her that was doing the screaming, but at the time, she wasn't quite within herself. And that's what we do, and that's what we practice. Because if you can see the things that you've tried to deny yourself with the lovely and willingness understanding, with the love of God, and actually it comes under the Archangel Michael, if you're, if you're interested in this, well, let it go, and your whole body will spring up. The weight that people carry is unbelievable. It will suddenly lift you up as if you've lost all the weight because you are responsible for your own life. Well, no matter whether you're well, unhappy is a good cause. But I'm saying always, you can't be born, you can't die without giving permission. I mean, if you go to the people, the old people in, in, um, in homes, they'll often say, I couldn't wait any longer. Or think, you must have done it. You've all got ancient relatives who say, we waited, but we couldn't wait any longer, we couldn't do this. Now, this is what Masonic, the benefits of Masonic training. And this is when Dan Brown says, have we got... God-given powers? And the answer is yes. They're trying to teach you that you create your future. And there's nothing you can't change except realizing you've got to undo what you've done. So it's a five-year runoff. If you start to emigrate, you start to get married, you start to get divorced, before you get settled, you can expect a five-year. It can be less. But for the average person, it's five years. So, learn to tolerate Learn to realize, like when you've resigned from a job you don't like, I'll be gone in three months, you don't care what shit comes your way, do you? <laughs> you know you're going to be gone. And that's the point of life. You've changed the plan, you've made mistakes, you're in the mud, well, it's going to go. Just stop worrying about it. Just plan the right bit to be more sensible next time. Out. And I've said all I want to say. I really do. All right? Well, no, the whole point of the Masonic that you were telling us, I said earlier, is the whole point of the Rosicrucians is that we debate. As it says here, any subject under the sun is open for debate. Come and join the society and tell me I'm wrong. Does anybody wish to um, uh, well, 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 I, 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 you have to be bored. I'll answer any questions if you've got any. I mean, I've, I've lived this stuff, but that's, I think I've talked enough and it's, you've got more to eat. What's the matter? Oh. Oh. Oh, yes. Sorry. Well, I don't know this. Okay, I suppose I can mention it. I have always, for the last 10 years, I, I, for the last 15 years, have been looking after the most haunted house in Reading, as I describe it, 
we don't say where it is, and it's not haunted, but it's very, very spiritually active, and the furniture flies around, we have writing inside double glazing, and all sorts of interesting This is why, of course, I'm not a, an evolutionist, because this isn't part of evolution. And I, I dare hardly to tell you this, and I don't know if I can touch it, it's still here, is I have brought this, this is an amazing piece of code, it is unbelievable, but there are 20 of these. Oh, no. There are 20 of these, and they materialize and disappear at regular intervals. And this is one of them. And just, oh, I'll just pull that off, sorry. Can you take that? Where do they materialize? Well, I can't, well, oh, it's somebody's house. Oh, in this, in this particular house. Yes, in this particular house. And the other day he had a party, and he brought a whole load of foreigners in, and they all dematerialized. All 27 have disappeared. And then when everybody had gone home and they cleaned up, they all came back again. But this is, this, this, this. Oh, it's not the farm of it. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no. No such luck. When I meant foreigners, I meant guests and friends and, uh, and things like that. So we have to be careful of them because they do disappear. We have, there are loads of bits and pieces that come and go. I know you'll find this absolutely impossible, but this is what I want to tell you. is the life I lead, I'm not an evolutionist. I believe you can change everything. I mean, the simple story... They demonstrate, don't they? Yes, they demonstrate to us what they were. We have a little example of this, which scared our little man absolutely, uh, whatever the word is, clean khaki pants. They had a car outside his house that had been abandoned, police aware, police aware. And it was there for weeks and weeks and weeks. The police aware didn't do anything, it never went. And the young man turns around to his parents and says, what we really need is a decent fire, that will get rid of it. And within two hours, the thing was on fire. Not only was it on fire, there was someone travelling down the road who suddenly realised there was a blue vertical light in the car. He stopped, turned round and came back and watched the fire through the windows as a vertical tubular of blue light that then went woof and burnt the car to cinders. And after that, he's terrified of his wish list. He's incredibly <laughs> careful. In fact, you know, he does have one more, didn't he? He has one... He had a really... The bicycle. Yeah, that was really bad. There was a really bad one with the bike. He has someone that lives opposite him uh, who has a bicycle shop, and it's right opposite where he works, and because they work and they use commercial vehicles, the guy outside was ever complaining, ever complaining that the vehicles were in his way for his bicycle shop. And they weren't on his side of the road, but it was part of life. There's not much to done about it. And one day, before this guy realised, be careful what you wish for, he thought, oh, God, this guy just needs to have a heart attack and fall off his bike. And two days later, he fell off his bike right in front of a car and nearly got run over. Since then, this guy has cleaned up his act. Believe you me, he's cleaned his act up. So, that what you wanted. But I've got so many of these. I've got to stop here. I've got to stop. It's for me to ask you all to give a round of applause.